feed. Um, this is an interesting problem. I was actually uh, uh, quite pleased that I've been asked to talk about this because this is something that I think all of us deal with all the time, but uh, I've never really tried to figure out what's the right way to do this. And, and so this is an interesting challenge for me, and I hope uh, I'll be able to enlighten all of you um, on, on this challenge that we face uh, probably on a daily basis in our nursing homes. So um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose other than I'm very passionate about geriatrics, about caring for older people, about uh, giving good quality care for older people as I've been at health centers for 10 years, plus 10 years, now probably 12 years, and have worked with Maureen for many, many of those years, um, and I love to work um, with this great company and in nursing homes. So simple enough, we're going to try to figure out what are some of the common complications with warfarin management and antibiotics, and then how can we work to get some strategies that are useful for all of you and, and us in managing uh, these patients. So just a brief reminder about what warfarin uh, is and does. It's a vitamin K antagonist. It decreases uh, the vitamin K dependent clotting factors in the body, so it's 2, 7, 9, and 10. Um, and it's really a rat poison, remember, it's what's been used to, uh, to uh, kill rats uh, in toxic doses, obviously, and in the therapeutic doses in humans, hopefully, uh, does not kill us. Um, but it may, as we all know. Uh, there are many drug, diet, comorbidity, and genetic variables that come into play, and it's a very complex and difficult medication to manage for many reasons. And one of them is that it has a very narrow therapeutic window. You know, we're looking generally two to three, maybe two and a half to three and a half when we've got a mechanical valve <laughs> involvement. Uh, but part of the problem is that it's 97% protein bound, mostly to albumin. So if you have an older person that gets sick, that doesn't eat, that, uh, that uh, and you know albumin is a, 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 an inflammatory marker, so it can come down when people get sick. So all of a sudden you have much more pre-warfarin in the system, and uh, it can uh, cause a lot of problems. So it's very difficult to keep it within that therapeutic window and to keep people from either being too low or too high. Generally speaking, we're successful only about 65% of the time. So that's, that's like a good rate. So that means about a third of the time people are either too low or too high with their warfarin. And antibiotics, and especially procedures, either stopping the medication uh, for a colonoscopy or for a surgical procedure of some sort, uh, often is what, have, what affects us being either too low or too high. Because even if we stop it and we start to back up on it, it often goes too high after that, they don't necessarily get back into a normal rhythm. Uh, but a lot of people are, are sort of out of range a lot of the time. Uh, I actually, in our practice, in our ambulatory practice, I've been working on this with Dr. Nanda in the back for about a year now, where we have a QI project, where we're trying to improve our uh, rate of uh, therapeutic INRs, and uh, we've been able to go from 60 to 65 percent. Uh, that's about as high as we can get, uh, so even that, that's still not great. Just a reminder of the a clotting pathway. You have your intrinsic pathway, your extrinsic pathway, and then the common pathway. And uh, warfarin effects as the prothrombin factor two level, uh, factor seven, factor nine, and factor ten. So it really affects the entire clotting pathway. So it's intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathway. <coughs> So warfarin in a nursing home, um, this is really the, the only nursing home specific data that I have that I was able to find. Um, 
but it doesn't mean that the other data that I'm going to be able to show you today is not useful, but it's not necessarily specific to nursing homes. Um, but what's interesting is that warfarin is the top reason for adverse drug uh, events in the nursing homes um, uh, for preventable and non-preventable, 15% um, and 12% for preventable adverse drug events. <coughs> And 20% of adverse drug events are hemorrhagic events, and 16% of preventable uh, adverse drug events are hemorrhagic. Uh, so this is uh, something that affects us on a regular basis, and that we, how can we do better to manage this? So how does warfarin and, and antibiotics, how do they interact, cause uh, problems? So the most common mechanism of disruption is disruption, there are three mechanisms uh, really, disruption of intestinal microflora. As you know, vitamin K is affected by intestinal uh, bacteria, and, and when we uh, affect that, it will affect the vitamin K absorption and metabolism. And then it, uh, um, uh, both pharmacists have talked about um, hepatic enzymes, uh, for the most part, antibiotics inhibit the hepatic CYP2C9, but may also inhibit 3A4 and 2C19, which both will affect the metabolism of warfarin. And then there might be changes in diet um, because of the antibiotics, <laughs> which then can affect uh, the INR through the diet that we change. Uh, but in addition, the infection itself might cause problems either by reducing the oral intake, causing diarrhea, or altering the metabolism. So most antibiotics, when we start an antibiotic when, on a patient who's on warfarin, the major effect is that it will make, it will potentiate the warfarin, it will make the INR higher. Um, and that increases our risk of bleeding. But there are some agents, which we'll talk about in a minute, that inhibit the effect of warfarin and that's increasing the risk of clotting. So uh, you have, uh, and there are, there's a great study that we'll go over in a bit that actually categorizes the risk, the most highest risk and the lowest risk. Um, but just keep in mind that even topical antibiotic agents might also uh, affect INR. So even if you think, oh, it's just the topical antibiotic, if you're putting it on a wide cloth of ulcer, it might not be this uh, benign. Um, and an interesting point, which I don't think I was uh, appreci as appreciative as, um, uh, of this prior to, to doing this research, was that the INR changes usually occur within three days, and we'll show some studies to, to confirm that. So if you check it in, in five days, you know, if it's a Thursday, and say, oh, it's you know, this weekend's a holiday, check it on Tuesday, um, you know, we'll be okay. They don't need to check it over the weekend, right? Wrong. That would, that would not be the right thing to do. So uh, if anything you come out of this is that you need to check the INR within three days of starting an antibiotic, changing an antibiotic, or stopping an antibiotic. Um, and, and we'll show some data to show that in a bit later on. Um, I just wanted to spell out some basic management principles that I have learned, that I have practiced, but also uh, learned through um, this review, that really there are no clear guidelines out there. So I was hoping that somebody had thought this through and could say, this is what you do, step A, B, C, and D, <coughs> voila, you're good to go, right? No, <laughs> we're not as lucky as that, unless somebody has found it, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, uh, but the basic principle is to try to avoid some of the antibiotics that are the worst offenders, and we'll go over that list in a bit. Um, if, if you have to start an antibiotic, and it is one of, especially if it's one of the worst offenders, then you measure within two to three days. Um, especially if somebody hasn't had a recent INR, if, they, if they're, you know, every four months, every four weeks, um, then you want to make sure you get an INR fairly soon. Um, some practices would cut the dose of warfarin, maybe in half, maybe by a third. Again, I was trying to look for guidelines. Is there something that we should be doing? 
And there really wasn't a recommendation for that. And um, in practice, you can see that sometimes that people, some people won't have any change in their INR. So, it, it, so by cutting it, the dose in half, you actually put them at risk for a low INR within uh, a few days. So um, I think that if somebody um, is very labile or tends to have high INRs, I might, I probably would recommend cutting the dose a little bit. But it's not something that you have to do, uh, according to my reading. Uh, if somebody is concurrently using Tylenol, so if you know if it's Tylenol, if you add Tylenol because they have fevers for their acute illness, or if they're on prednisone because they've got a respiratory uh, illness, they've got a COPD exacerbation of some sort, and you're adding Tylenol, or Tramadol, or anti-ulcers, those all can simultaneously interact and make your INR worse. So you have to be extra careful with these agents. And also, if your antibiotic dose is increased, let's say they get worse, and you increase the dose of the antibiotic, that means you have to again remeasure within a couple of days, uh, two to three days, to verify um, that it hasn't increased your INR significantly. Or if you add another antibiotic to the mix. And we actually show that, that co-administering with two, two antibiotics significantly increases your risk of a high INR. Also, um, something that I honestly don't think that I have been as aggressive about is monitoring once they stop the, uh, the antibiotic, especially if I've made a dose adjustment uh, with the antibiotic, uh, to closely monitor after the antibiotics are stopped. Um, and when in doubt, make sure you look up uh, the in interaction. Um, Look up the guidelines, either in the properties, like to come, whatever, the, or call your pharmacist. Your family pharmacist would be happy, I'm sure, to help out uh, on this. So let's go over some of the literature that we've seen. Um, this is a great systematic overview of warfarin and drug and food interactions. It wasn't specifically for antibiotics, um, but I thought it had a great methodology they actually look at uh, a very uh, concise and precise method for analyzing um, the high probability, probable, possible, or highly improbable mechanism. And some of the criteria was, did, did, was, it, was there a time association? You know, is the INR higher just immediately after starting the antibiotic? Did it go down after stopping the antibiotic? Did, uh, was there a dose effect? So they, they had some very uh, um, rigorous and I thought uh, had face validity criteria for establishing a system of analyzing what the potential effects of uh, antibiotics are on warfarin. And so these are the agents for anti-infectives. They had all the other agents there as well, but I wanted to focus on this. So the agents that a high probability of potentiation, so that means that it would increase the INR and increase your risk of bleeding. The high probable agents were Cipro, Clotrimoxazole, clotrim Erythromycin, Fluconazole, Azoniazid, Metronidazole, Myconazole, and uh, another Azole, Voriconazole. Um, here as well was uh, Augmentin, Azithromycin, Clarithromycin, Levo, um, so possible were some of the augmentin, uh, amoxicillin agents, I'm sorry, uh, just plain amoxicillin, um, uh, ofloxacillin, and highly improbable was cefazole and uh, sulfazoxazole. And then the agents that were inhibitory, so that might even lower the INR, uh, were nacillin, uh, rifampin, uh, probably dicloxacillin, and then highly improbable cloxacillin um, and, and nasacillin dicloxacillin. I'm not sure why the combination doesn't impact, whereas the individual agent does, but that's what they found. So concurrent use of warfarin and antibiotics and the risk of bleeding in older adults, this is a great uh, study it looked at a case control nested within a cohort. So um, this is a study that had a large number of 
patients, 38,000 patients over the age of 65 on continuous warfarin. And what they did was they looked at the cases, which were patients hospitalized for a primary diagnosis of bleeding, and then they looked at the matched controls. So each case matched with three controls by age, race, sex, and the reason for their warfarin uh, indication, whether it was atrial fibrillation, DVT, or um, mechanical valve. So they did a pretty good match. So they can only match for so many things. Um, but uh, there were the, the patients who were the controls tended to have fewer comorbidities and were like, less likely to be from a nursing home. So it makes it a little bit uh, sort of biased that the uh, cases are might be sicker or frailer. Uh, but they can sort of control for that statistically. Uh, what they found was that uh, among the cases, so the bleeding cases versus the non-bleeding cases, uh, the use of an antibiotic uh, increased your risk of bleeding by two times. Um, and this is the multivariate uh, uh, controlling for all these factors that they weren't able to control during the matching. So you were two times more likely to have a bleeding incident if you had been on an antibiotic versus not. Um, you were 70% um, more likely if you uh, had a, a GI bleed requiring hospitalization in the cases. Um, and then days from initiation of prescription. So if it was recent, you, you had more than a two and, almost two and a half times more likely risk. So that makes a little bit of sense because if you, you're on vancomycin or some agent for uh, six weeks, by then you can assume that people have been checking the INR and things are a little bit more stable. But if the antibiotic was just recently started, and that's when you see these fluctuations in INR up and down. So recently uh, added antibiotics were more likely to cause a bleeding hospitalization. And then what's interesting is that concurrent use of other medications, we talked about prednisone or corticosteroids here, but there's also SSRIs. So they're 35% more likely to have a bleeding incident if they're also taking an SSRI. And SNRI, like Effexor, Cymbalta, um, antiplatelet agents, which I guess it doesn't, doesn't require a brain scientist. I mean, it just makes sense. If they're already on an antiplatelet, they're more likely to bleed. Um, or a CYP to CP, unfortunately. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe they know. <laughs> um, but increasing, if you're on a lot of other medications, which most of our nursing home residents are, that certainly increases your risk. And then the specific agent, uh, which agents were most likely to be associated with increased risk of hospitalization and bleeding. Um, so azoles were four and, a half, four and a half times more likely. So a 457% increased risk of bleeding if you're taking an antifungal. Um, so they are by far, uh, according to this study, the highest risk of bleeding hospitalization. Then it's actually uh, clotrimazole, uh, cephalosporins, penicillins, macrolides, and less quinolones, according to this study. Um, this other study looks at uh, an outpatient anticoagulation clinic and their risk of bleeding, uh, of interaction. So what they did is a retrospective, this is a VA study. Um, so as you can expect, with VA studies, they're mostly white male, um, uh, and that's to be expected. But they looked at all pa patients over age 65 who had been stable on warfarin uh, between 2003 and 2011 who were given an antibiotic. They ended up only getting 205 patients, which I thought was small um, for this study. So. Uh, this graph shows time one and time two are free antibiotic uh, time points. So it, it shows some relative stability in the INRs, and on average they're between two and two and a half. Uh, time three and time four are the post-antibiotic times, and as you can see, they're creeping up to above three and above, closer to four in some cases. 
So they actually uh, found no significant differences between each of the antibiotics, although it looks like there's a difference here. It was not statistically significant. But what they did find is that people over 80, which I would argue is the vast majority of our patients in nursing homes, um, were much more likely to have an increase of INR compared to a younger cohort, 65 to 70. So we have to be extra careful with our old, old patients which are most of our residents in the nursing home. This looked at the, at the uh, INR change between pre-antibiotic and post-antibiotic, looking at quinolones versus, I mean, fluoroquinolones versus azithromycin. And as you can see, for respiratory illnesses, the change was much higher than for um, urinary tract or soft tissue infections. Uh, you can argue that that might have been a dose effect, so it's possible that the doses were higher uh, for respiratory infections than for urinary tract infections. I, I, I can only speculate. So this is another cohort uh, study among veterans, and they looked at serious bleeding events uh, for, for warfarin and antibiotic co-prescriptions. So this is a much larger study. It looked at 22,000 veterans on warfarin between 2002 and 2008. And the way that they did this is they looked at, they, they divided the cohort between uh, veterans who had a high-risk antibiotic, uh, which they defined as, as East Asian, Cipro, Levo, Metronidazole, Fuconazole, Zithromycin, and Clomistromycin, versus low-risk uh, antibiotics, but they only chose two, uh, clindamycin and cephalaxin. Um, and then they compare the bleeding risk for patients high risk versus low risk. So this can give you some guidance as to whether choosing a low risk antibiotic uh, for your uh, uh, residents on warfarin might reduce their risk of bleeding. So as their baseline demographics, they weren't exactly um, uh, uh, completely aligned. Of course, this is a, a retrospective cohort. It's not a placebo-controlled trial, so they can't really match everybody. Um, so the high-risk, uh, the patients who got high-risk antibiotics were older. Uh, they uh, were slightly less male, although it's 98 versus 97 percent. Um, they were more likely to be uh, uh, African American. Uh, they were more likely to have malignancy, chronic lung disease, and they were like, le more likely, or less likely, sorry, to have a heart valve replacement. And um, they were more likely to have drug interactions with other medications that they were taking, and live farther away from the VA, which was an interesting um, characteristic that I hadn't thought about. But certainly, if you're farther away, you might get fewer INR, it might be harder to get an INR. Um, so this is the primary table looking at uh, the people who had a bleeding event versus a non-bleeding event, and what were the risk factors or the hazards ratio for leading to a bleeding event. And those that are highlighted are the ones that were statistically significant. So people with chronic lung disease, renal failure, liver failure were much more likely to have a bleeding event, um, which we can argue that a lot of our residents in nursing homes, uh, people who had a heart valve replacement, and you can rationalize that that might be because their INR is typically on the higher end. We aim for a two and a half to three and a half sometimes, or closer to three rather than two and a half, um, if you can be that precise. I've had people, I don't know if you guys, it's ever happened to you that somebody's discharged to your nursing home with uh, an order that the INR needs to be between 2.2 and 2.6. <laughs> like, I think it happened. <laughs> um, but they tend to be on the higher end. Um, and as well, being on a high risk antibiotic, you were 50% more likely to have a bleeding incident than if you were on a low-risk antibiotic. Now, when they broke it down by the different antibiotics, um, the only one that was statistically significant was azithromycin. Um, but they had, in this cohort, a huge rate of azithromycin, 25% of the uh, 
people who had a high risk incident, who had a, a bleeding incident or non bleeding incident were actually um, on azithromycin. So, uh, in summary, in this study, if you had renal failure, if you had a heart valve indication, if you were uh, given a high risk antibiotic, especially azithromycin, uh, those were all independently associated with uh, uh, a risk of uh, increased bleeding incidence. Um, so, this, then they, they divided it by the level of INR increase, greater than four, four to six or greater than six. And certainly you can argue that you're going to worry more about the people with an INR over six um, and, uh, at, at, for their risk of bleeding. I, I certainly do. I, my blood pressure goes up when somebody's INR is over six a bit more. Um, and the agents that were associated with a higher INR over six were metronidazole, fluconazole, which again, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, risk was 9.7%. Um, and then here is what I mentioned earlier, if you co-prescribe, so if you co-prescribe two high-risk medications, you're more likely, or even if you co-prescribe a high-risk and a low-risk, you also had a higher risk of uh, bleeding complications, or a higher risk of having an INR over six. Uh, this study uh, is a great study, um, Warfarin Associated Research Projects and Other Endeavors Consortium, which I thought was great. And it's a JAMA study on warfarin interactions with antibiotics in the ambulatory care setting. And what they did was a study out of Kaiser Permanente in Colorado. I'm not sure how generalizable that is to Rhode Island. I think people in Colorado might be a different breed <laughs> altogether. <laughs> I'm not sure how the, you know, this was pre-marijuana, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they looked at a, a large cohort of retrospective patients for a, a six-year time frame or seven-year time frame. And they looked at their INR changes for three groups. So this is an interesting group because it's an interesting study. It's slightly different than the others. But they looked at groups, the patients who had uh, a re upper respiratory tract infection were, were given an antibiotic. Those that were sick, that had an upper respiratory tract infection but no antibiotic, um, and then the stable but not sick, so people were just on warfarin and generally on warfarin. And their primary outcome was a change in INR but also the rate of INR greater than 5. So they didn't actually look at bleeding risk in this study per se. And this is just the graph that illustrates those two. They also had different time frames for the follow-up INR so that you can imagine that people who were given a, an antibiotic or who were sick had much sooner INR time frames than the people who were stable, which I'm not sure how that affects the study per se. But. So um, in the terms of the baseline characteristics for these three groups, the people receiving antibiotics versus the two control groups, the sick and the stable. Um, those on antibiotics tend to be older, 70 versus 67 and 66 years of age. They were more likely to be female. Um, they were more likely to have AFib, uh, have cardiovascular disease, and more likely to be in range at baseline, which is interesting. Um, not sure why. Um, so when they looked at the frequency of antibiotic use, remember that other study in the VA, so many people were on this azithromycin. This group is only 4.4%. The highest range were amoxicillin, cephalexin, and cipro. So I, um, I'm not sure how that would compare to Rhode Island or even uh, what we do in our nursing homes. So, uh, but uh, certainly these are fairly common agents that we use. So when they look at the primary outcome, which was 30-day um, uh, days, uh, mean INR and INR that were elevated, uh, what's interesting is that they also look at the mean time between uh, the date and the follow-up INR. And so as you can expect, the people who were stable had a longer time frame, nine days. Uh, but the people receiving antibiotics had an average time from antibiotic start to INR of six days. 
So these people were not following my recommendation. I'm not sure why, but they, they, that should have been more closer to three or two to three. Um, the sick people actually had a sooner time to INR than the people given antibiotics. I'm not sure why. Um, there were significant differences in mean uh, INR change uh, for those on antibiotics uh, and sick, uh, but not for those who were stable. And so this sort of validates what I said earlier, that the people um, might have INR changes just because they're sick, even if you don't start antibiotics. So you need to, you need to monitor them as well. And then the, but the rate of INR over five was greater on the uh, patients receiving antibiotics. So that's 3.2% versus 2.6 versus 1.2. Um, and they did not notice any difference in, in the, some of the bleeding outcomes, thrombosis, bleeding, or mortality. Um, when they looked at the uh, by antibiotic, which antibiotic was more likely to cause an, a 9R over 5. We got azithromycin again as one of our culprits. Cipro, doxy, levo, and moxifloxacin all in that uh, range. And here, what are the factors associated with an INR 5 or more? So these uh, five agents were most likely to be associated. So if they were uh, receiving an antibiotic, they were more likely to have an INR over five. If they were the sick group compared to the stable group, just being sick increased your risk. Female sex, um, age, although it wasn't significant, um, uh, pre-index INR on the higher end, so between two and a half to three versus two to two and a half. So even if you were in the therapeutic range, but you were on the higher end of the therapeutic range, you were more likely to get over five than if you were on the lower end of the therapeutic range. And if you were above three, again, you were two and a half times almost more likely to have uh, an INR over five. So, um, so I think it might be worthwhile if we're starting people, what I read from this is if I'm starting somebody on antibiotics, and I say, are they on warfarin? And then they say yes. And then I have to, the next question should be, what's their, what was their last INR in my mind? And if, if it was 3.1, then I might check it in two days. If it was 2.1, I might check it in three days. But I, I wouldn't go beyond that. So antibiotics to avoid, uh, we saw that the antifungal, although it's not an antibiotic, I know. But the antifungals are the worst offenders, so be extra, extra careful when you have to put uh, one of our residents on, uh, on um, an antifungal. Uh, Moxazole, metronidazole, macrolides, and fluoroquinolone are some of the worst offenders. Um, and then potentially safer, uh, clindamycin, although I know this is an antibiotic stewardship program. Clindamycin um, might be associated with higher C. diff, although there's some controversy about that. But I know it's an agent, so you might not want to try to avoid. Might not want to give it for that. Um, amoxicillin alone. Cephalaxin, probably your best agent. Nitrofurantoin and trimethoprim. So in conclusion, I want you to be extra vigilant. Uh, more vigilant than we probably are uh, currently, um, especially if the baseline INR is over 2.5 or the pre-antibiotic INR is over 2.5. And if they're ill, if they have a high comorbidity, high medication uh, burden as well, uh, be extra vigilant. Especially monitor within three days of starting, increasing, adding, or stopping an antibiotic. Uh, and then think about implementing some sort of systemic way that your nurses um, can can sort of do this automatically. You know, instead of um, relying on uh, the four docs 
uh, memory to, to remind them of these things. Because uh, I don't know about you, but most nursing homes, um, there might be multiple providers uh, that you're interacting with, even for a given uh, resident, uh, especially on the skilled unit. You might talk to the MP one day, the PA the next day, the doctor the next day, the fellow the next day, the on-call person the next day. They're all sort of making decisions about these INR management. Uh, they're making decisions about when to check another INR, what to do with the warfarin, and they might not have the entire context. I don't know, maybe you have it all figured out. But I know, <laughs> I know even in the institutions that I'm in, we certainly don't have it all figured out. And so if you had sort of a protocol that said we have a patient, a resident on warfarin, our protocol is we check it after day three, if we increase the dose, if we add an antibiotic, we check it again in three days, if we stop the antibiotic, we check it again. And if you can, try to use the low risk antibiotics whenever possible. Of course, there are many factors that come into play your, you know, antibiogram, uh, allergies, uh, side effects, so uh, previous side effects to these antibiotics 